One night I called home, I couldn't reach my mom on the phone. I was worried, I tried my brother, he wasn't answering. What was going on? I just thought perhaps they're all engaged and they can't answer the phone. So I decided the next day to wake up and go home. Caught a taxi and upon arrival, I didn't know where to go because when I got home, <laughs> It was all locked, nobody was there, and you could see nobody had been there for quite a while. Good day, everybody. My name is Abigail Ruth Mabatumunyai, um, and I am the author of a book series titled From the View of a Preacher's Kid. I was born and bred in the small town, Luitrichat. <laughs> this town is found in Limpopo. I am an orphan. And I only have one sibling by the name of Carol Praise Munyai. Growing up, I had a really good bond with my father, a bond that words could never explain. One day, on a Wednesday, I arrived home from school and I found him standing by his toilet. And I asked him if he was okay. He said he was, but I could see from his facial expression that he wasn't. <sighs> that day I was going to get my hair done a house away from home and I then explained to him that it was time for me to go. He then said he would gladly accompany me. We took that walk together and just as the lady began to do my hair, he then said to me, Abigail, I am leaving. I didn't quite understand or I didn't at that moment realize the deeper meaning in those words. He said he was leaving and he was indeed. I just didn't understand how. I then, I then looked at him and I said, no, it's okay. I'll see you when I get home. Two days later, he stopped speaking. And literally, he was no longer able to speak. My mom and brother rushed him to the hospital and that Sunday at church, I went to the bathroom and I began to pray. And I said, God, this is a man of God. He's a pastor of a congregation, a father to his children, a husband to his wife. And he played a huge role in the community altogether. He was a principal of a school, a very loved, he was needed in society and I tried to plead my case to God in that prayer. Monday morning I was at school when my aunts came to fetch me. They told me that we were going to see my dad in hospital. But when I arrived home something was just weird. There were tons and tons of cars and I, I, I was still young at that time so I didn't make much of it but when we walked in Everybody hugged me and my brother and they told us that my father had passed away. It was on the 23rd of January, my mom's birthday. And since that day, the day carried a bitter, sweet aroma to it because we never knew whether we should be happy or whether we should be sad. My mom was broken. We were all broken. We were shattered. And then it came back to me. He told me he was leaving. I just didn't know where to. Since then, life became very, very difficult. I remember in the year of 2007, the well-known pastor Ntunzi Namba was holding a conference. It was the seventh of the seventh month in 2007. And he made a prophecy to my mom. He said to her, your finances are going to change. <laughs> we became so happy and we thought, wow, life is going to get better. You know, God is going to change our situation. But it actually meant the opposite. My mom opened several businesses in attempt to make a living for herself. And all of them collapsed. It became so, so bad. We had no food in the house. There was no electricity. She couldn't pay school fees. She couldn't buy us supplies. No stationery, no clothes, no electricity. 
things began to get rotten in the fridge. And of course, <laughs> the bond on the house was due. Such a difficult time. I remember it as if it were yesterday. We would try to make the most of what we had. But as you all know, that's not as easy as it sounds. I watched our furniture get auctioned away. I watched them foreclose the house. My mom tried to be strong through it all, without any support from relatives, without any support from anybody. All we had was each other. <laughs> My mom then tried to rent out an apartment. We went and lived there. And I could see that she was broken and she was trying to hold on with her very last strength. <laughs> After that, I remember going to varsity and she couldn't afford for me to go to varsity. So by the grace of God, I had received a bursary and I was studying. One night I called home, I couldn't reach my mom on the phone. I was worried, I tried my brother. He wasn't answering. What was going on? I just thought perhaps they're all engaged and they can't answer the phone. So I decided the next day to wake up and go home. Caught a taxi and upon arrival, I didn't know where to go because when I got home, <laughs> it was all locked. Nobody was there and you could see nobody had been there for quite a while. So I asked my neighbors, I, I tried reaching my mom and when I finally got hold of her, what I found out is they had been locked out of that flat because my mom was unable to pay. She had actually resigned from her work to become a full-time pastor as she said God had called her to do. She was homeless, we were all homeless. We didn't have a place to sleep. She had been sleeping at different, place, uh, different houses every night you know, jumping from one friend to the next. And my brother as well, just trying to get a roof over his head every night, trying to get food into his stomach every night. They didn't even have a change of clothes because they were locked out. One man, she said it was a friend of hers, had her farm and he said on his farm he had a house. It was a very old dilapidated house and that's where his workers were living. And he said he could give her a room and indeed, she moved there. Um, the place was very bad. You know, when I, when I went to see her there, my heart just tore into pieces. It stunk, it was dirty, you know. And I kept wondering, what's the point of having relatives if they don't help you in your time of need, you know? What's the point of having people around you if they can't help you in your time of need? This was a woman of God, you know. I didn't understand what was happening. It was horrible. It was really horrifying for me to see at such a young age. Then my brother went into business with his friend and just as the business was picking up, then they threatened to foreclose on my mom's car. It was an Isuzu, a double cab. And it was owing quite a huge amount of money. And my friend and his friend, uh, and my brother and his friend then decided that they would pay it off so that it doesn't get foreclosed. And they did. But that was just a tip of the iceberg. Greater was still to come. We were still going to go through mountains and mountains of issues. And so he got a place to rent and so she moved in with them so she could finally move away from that horrible place on the farm. And as she was staying there, um, you know, she, she was trying to make the most of what she could. And then she was able to get another place to rent, a small two bedroom house. Um, at that time, I fell pregnant out of wedlock. And I remember that it was nine months into my pregnancy. So it was right around the expectancy date. We had a baby shower on a Sunday. And then the following Sunday, my mom passed away in the house. She actually woke up in the morning, asked my brother to get her milk. She said she felt heartburn. At that time, we didn't think much of it. But then we went into her room and found that she was gone. Obviously, 
at such a young age, we didn't really think that she was gone. So we tried carrying her into the car. And I remember I was nine months pregnant, so I couldn't help carry. My brother ran out and he tried to find someone to help him to carry her into the car. They carried her into the car and upon arrival at the hospital, she was declared dead. And it, it then made sense that she had been dead all along. I was so angry at God. I had prayed, I had applied the recipe and I was expecting it to be successful. I had been taught my whole life, being born into a Christian family, being born into a pastor's house, being a preacher's kid, I knew that prayer worked. I knew that prayer was effective. And if I prayed, I expected the results that came along with prayer. And I believed, I truly believed that I had full faith and they both died anyways, irrespective of my prayer, irrespective of what I had done, following all the steps as I should have in the recipe. She died. He died. I was so angry. <sighs> a few days later, I gave birth to my firstborn son by the name of Taylor. I was so numb throughout because my mom had just passed away. I had just buried her. I was angry at the world, angry at this God. And I felt like he wasn't there for me at the time that I needed him the most. I, I just didn't understand. I felt that we had been through enough. We had been through so much. And yet this again, remember, because we didn't have a house, we didn't have a home, and she had rented out the apartment, we didn't have a place to stay after she passed away. So I had to start working at a very young age, forcing me to mature at a very young age. I, I then started working at a bank and then my brother and I rented out an apartment together. We were trying our best to survive. No help from anybody, just the two of us. We worked and we tried to make the most of what we could at that time. And immediately, while I'm still trying to get into a new life, to turn over a new leaf, to stand on my feet. I got a lot of phone calls from relatives, from people in the community, and they were talking down at me for having this child outside of wedlock. And they were saying I would need then to marry the father of my child, to try and live up to the image or to, to the memory of my parents as pastors, because having a child out of wedlock as a Christian is a sin. And I had this guilt, I had this pressure from society, I had this pressure from people that I expected to protect me. And so I caved, I gave in. I then tried by all means to, to, to correct my first mistake of getting pregnant out of wedlock by another mistake, getting married without understanding the implications, without understanding the consequences, without even understanding the institution of marriage itself. And at that time, financially, my partner wasn't ready. And I, I tried my best to help him financially so that we could get married and correct the first mistake. Little did I know this was another mistake. On our wedding day, I should have been happy. It was my wedding day. It was the saddest day of my life. I, I, I was under so much pressure trying to make everybody happy at my own expense. So many instances, so many things happen on that day that even if I try to talk about them, it would take me days. It was so difficult. My mom wasn't there and none of her relatives came to support me. It was only her two brothers out of the entire family. Um, all her sisters didn't come. Their husbands didn't come. Their children didn't come. It was only the two uncles. And I felt so alone. But once again, I had to be brave and go through with it because I had to set the record straight and I had to make things right. 
at least to honor the memory of my parents. So got married a year later. Um, it had been a horrible year, by the way, a year where there was no intimacy in my relationship. I, I, I was dealing with the in-laws, dealing with all of these issues by myself. Um, I found out that my partner was cheating on me. And when I tried to report him to the pastor, he became abusive. He would throw me against the wardrobe because he'd like, he wanted to take the phone away from me. The phone that had all the evidence on it, and that's the evidence I wanted to produce to the pastor as proof of what he had been doing. Um, we went for marriage counseling. I played by the book. I really did try my best to save that marriage for the memory of my parents, as the pressure from society, you know, was forcing me to do. Um, <laughs> I remember not feeling anything. It just became a life that I would wake up every day, sleep, as long as everybody was happy. I was trying to please everybody but myself. It got to a point where I said, enough is enough. I'm not doing this anymore. And I filed for divorce. After having done all to save the fuss of a marriage, I failed. So I set up the divorce all by myself. I didn't tell a single soul. Um, and when he realized that I had filed for divorce, he became violent. He started accusing me of promiscuity. He started accusing me of a lot of things and he would come to where I stayed and he would bang on the doors he would threaten to break down the, 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 the you know the doors and the butlers. And I was very afraid because I was living alone. And I remember opening the door for him. He shouted at me. He, he was a new person. When I looked in his eyes, I didn't recognize him. You know, I tried to run away. He chased me. He caught me. And nobody was doing anything. The neighbors, nobody was reacting. Um, I was so afraid I couldn't sleep that night. You know, I remember in the morning I went to work and everybody at work looked at me and they said, what's wrong with you? And I explained what happened. My boss then asked one of my colleagues to accompany me to the police um, department. We then filed for a protection order, which was granted. I had never been so afraid in my life and I was never given an opportunity to communicate what I was going through. I was going through it all alone. Hmm. I still wonder how I made it till this day. It was horrible. It was a very horrible, lengthy uh, divorce process because then there was custody of the child where we were fighting. And I felt like, what's the use of me even being alive? Everything in my life has been a battle. You know, without my parents, life has been horrible. It was a huge wake up call that being an orphan actually meant that the, the people that brought you into this world, the people that cared about you, are no longer there, it's just you. I struggled, I really struggled to come to peace with my new identity and the consequences of being an orphan. I then said to God, you know what, I have been faithful, I have been your child, I have done everything that I should have done and was expected to do. And yet my life is only a story of pain after pain, just as Joseph, betrayal after betrayal. There was nothing that was working out in my life and there was nothing I could do to make it work. And so I said, God, I'm taking a break from believing in you, from praying to you. All I've done has not paid off. So I'm stopping right here. I'm stopping and I'm giving myself to the world and whatever happens, happens. And I threw myself into the world. I got lost into drinking. I got lost into a life where I was trying to find myself because I, I, I had lost myself, you know, my identity. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know who I believed in or what I believed in anymore. And it was just so difficult and painful. And the only way to numb the pain was to be drunk. Nobody even knew what I was going through. I was drowning in my own issues and I was waving for people to try and save me, but no one could see that I was drowning. Everybody assumed I was okay because if everybody asks you, how are you doing? The standard response is, I'm okay. 
even though you're not. He kept on threatening me, even after the divorce. You know, he would harass me and it was so difficult. He supported his child for a while and then he stopped. You know, he stopped caring. <laughs> then the financial expense of raising my child was now only on me. And at that time, I was... I was earning peanuts. I couldn't even make ends meet. I couldn't, I was living, you know, the whole eating or living hand to mouth thing was even better than what I was going through because I could barely afford to live life. Life was so difficult for me and I, I, I couldn't explain. And all throughout these years, I'm busy having dreams that I can't even explain. You know, I, I'm going through emotional chaos physical chaos spiritual chaos at the same time i didn't understand what what was going on because my dreams were you know in my dreams i would see myself praying and casting out demons and what was manifesting in my life total opposite i couldn't explain or understand myself what was going through i remember there was a time i felt so sick that i couldn't walk my feet were so painful I couldn't walk. When we went to the doctor, he said it can't be arthritis. He couldn't even say what it was, but I couldn't walk. The pain was excruciating. When I had blankets on, my feet would be like, they, it was like they were burning. When I take the blankets off, my feet are so cold. I didn't understand what am I supposed to do. He suggested meds, you know, uh, anti-inflammatories. I took them, a, a change of diet. I stopped taking any type of spice and I stuck only to chicken. And I tried so much, but I, and throughout that period of my sickness, I'm dreaming these uh, dreams that I cannot explain where I'm seeing uh, a, a, a spiritual warfare. And in that spiritual warfare, I had to cast out the demon and I had to deal with it. I, I didn't have the strength at that time. I didn't have the knowledge. I didn't understand what was going on. It was all too much and all at once. And when I, when I tried to stand up, I kept getting knocked down. When I tried to get on my knees, I kept getting knocked down. Nothing was working out for me. I cannot even begin to explain the kind of sufferings I went through. And when I, when I look back only at that section or that portion of my life, I only see the grace of God because as angry as I was at him, I could see that still his love, his mercy and his protection was there for me. Nothing ever came easy into my life. Every single place that I went to, I realized that my new identity came with a new a set of issues, a new set of problems, a new set of sufferings that I had to go through. You know, as an orphan, life is not easy. You have to do everything by yourself and everybody takes advantage of you. I've had people tell me to my face, you know what? In this family, you have to take whatever you get because there's no one there to support you. And really, there's no one there to support me. I face everything on a daily basis on my, on my own. When I had my operations, when, when I was in hospital, I wished my mom was there to nurse me back to health. Every single time I was in hospital and I lay in my bed, I thought of my parents. And I thought of, there's nobody coming to visit me at this hospital. I'm all alone. And I, that was the story of my life. All the time I was alone. In every situation I was alone. No matter what problem I faced, I was alone. And the biggest clash that I had was within myself. That's the biggest problem I had. Because the only God that I was raised to know, I was angry at. The only God that I was raised to serve, I felt had left me all by myself. I cried. If pillows could talk, if walls could talk, I cried. And I, 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 I had no peace. I had no joy in my life. But then God remembered me. You see, everything that you go through in life has a purpose. 
And at that moment, you may not realize it. At that moment, it may not make sense to you because the constant confusion or the constant misunderstanding is that you are born as a preacher's kid because you need to become somebody as a result of the family you are born into. In layman English, as a preacher's kid, community places us on pedestals that we could never live up to. People have expectations of us that we could never ever live up to. People looked at me and as a worshiper and as a preacher's kid, people expected me to always be holier than thou, to be perfect. Nobody is perfect. For only Jesus is holy, only God is holy. The rest of us are not holy. And we could never ever live up to that. It was then where God revealed to me the purpose in my life. It was then where God revealed to me who I really was. And he said to me, my child, you are not who you are because of the family you are born into. But you were born into the family that you were born into because of who you are. Your destiny is so great that we needed to place you in a family that could groom you. That could, that the, the instances and the tribulations that you went through and everything that you went through. It needed to be in that specific order. You needed to be born into this family. Born in this town. At this time. For this generation. Because of the purpose. Because of your destiny. And because of who you are. And what you carry within you. To say that everything does happen for a reason. There is no such thing as a coincidence. I didn't lose my father. I didn't lose my mother. I didn't go through a divorce. I wasn't alone in life. I wasn't homeless in life. I wasn't in and out of hospital by myself for no good reason. It's because of who I am today. And then I met the love of my life. <laughs> I have a mentor, Pastor Mohari. You know, he was always there for me and my mom and all of us through it all. And when I introduced the love of my life to him, he said something that even today resonates. He said, this man came into your life to wipe your tears. And that's exactly what he has done. As much as life has been harsh, difficult, lonely, I met Ndibo Lodric Gogeda and he changed my life. He wiped my tears and God blessed us, took away that loneliness. You know, I went from being alone to having my own little family. You know, God blessed us with two beautiful kids. Um, <laughs> the elder one is called Ofunwao and the younger one is called Ebi Onangwao. Between the two of us, we actually have five kids. We have two beautiful princesses and three princes. God has been so faithful. He has enlarged my territory and he has blessed us beyond our wildest imagination. <laughs> Today, I am an author of a book series. Today, I am a minister of the word of God. Today, I am counseling individuals today. I am a motivational speaker and today I can sit here and talk to all of you because of what I've been through. My name is Abigail Ruth Mabatumunyai and I have been through the most. <laughs>